So we've been talking about the extent of the atonement. We've talked about um, a particular view called universalism. We've also talked about Arminianism. And we need to go back and look at these even more in depth. But I'm, I'm trying to just give you some framework and some, some ideas about how this works philosophically, theologically, logically, so that you can sort of put this together and, 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 and help to um, understand why maybe certain people see things the way that they, they see it. Um, Calvinism, which again comes from John Calvin. Um, Calvinism is not that different from Augustine, who was, you know, fifth century. So, I mean, you, you know, but he gets the name um, for, for this. Um, you, you also may hear this as Reformed theology. Um, now, Reformed theology has many different facets to it on all kinds of different theological issues. But traditionally, Reformed theology, when it comes to soteriology, when it comes to the atonement, um, is, is also referred to as Calvinism. This is also referred to um, as what we call a limited atonement. And let me be let me be fair to Calvinism and the Reformed um, uh, to Reformed theology. Nobody, I mean, I'm sure somebody, but in, in the aggregate, the larger group, nobody believes that Jesus could not have secured the salvation for everybody. Um, the, the way it normally gets phrased is that Jesus's death was sufficient for all, but efficient for the elect. And what we mean by that is, is that one drop of Jesus's blood could have saved everybody without exception. But biblically, reading it scripturally, reading it theologically, and looking at the, at, at the Bible as a whole, um, Reformed theology or Calvinism or, or limited atonement would say that where the sufficiency is at is not what we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about the efficiency. And the efficiency, what, what was efficacious on the cross, is that Jesus secured the salvation for his church, for his people, for the elect. So the efficacy in Calvinism or a limited atonement or Reformed theology is limited. This is where we get this word limited from. It is limited. It is limited for to those in which it is secured for. In other words, in Calvinism or in Reformed thought, the atonement is, is limited. It's not for everybody. It's for the elect. But the, the atonement, the, what Jesus did on the cross, although it's limited, it's, it's limited for the group that it was secured for. So when we talk about that the efficacy is limited to those in which it's secured for, let me put this in another way. Christ died with the intent to and, 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 and for a certain result. That his intention and the result of his death was for the elect. He died with the intent and the result of dying for the elect. So his intent was the same thing as the result. If you remember, when we talked about universalism, th th they said that Jesus died for all without exception, and his intent was the same as the result, so everybody saved. Of course, the problem is, is that we, we can't really support in the Bible that everybody seems to be with the Lord at the end. There seems to be some people that um, are not with the Lord. And so Reformed theology, Calvinism, limited atonement says, no, the universalists are right that his intent needs to be efficacious. There needs to be the result that the intent was, or it's not real. In other words, it, was, it wasn't really secured. It was possibly offered, 
but not securely offered. And, and a possible offer creates all kinds of confusion, but an efficacious result doesn't. Like we can ground our faith in the efficacy of the result. So the intent that God had for Jesus dying on the cross accomplished the result that the intent was, and that was that he died for a certain group of people, not without exception, but without distinction. So the intent and the result in Calvinism, or Reformed thought, is logically consistent and philosophically coherent, and it differs from universalism, not in its coherence. It, it, it differs from universalism in the fact that its coherence seems to be more in line with the larger narrative of Scripture than universalism does. And, and, and I think the, the, one of the things that makes Calvinism and Reformed theology so powerful, and I can just tell you as a, um, as a professor, I, I've watched many people come through seminary, and I've watched many people go to school, and, and when all of the things are presented, because Calvinism and because Reformed theology is so coherent and it really does um, you know, make sense of things very well, um, a, a lot of people become Reformed. Um, and you know, you'll see a, a lot of professors, a lot of seminarians, and, and those that teach, um, there, there is a large group of them that, that are Reformed. And it's, and it's because it seems to make sense of the data. Like we, we would think that when Jesus died, that he actually accomplished what he died for, rather than he died and he held out a possibility of what he of what he died for. Now, look, we're going to have to go into all these more in depth and look at these more 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 in, in in depth. But but I want you to see that you know there's universalism, there's Arminianism, there's Calvinism. I want you to see how how these work. And and I and I I'm not trying to get you to buy in to one system or, or like one system more than the other. I, I'm really trying to get us to see as students that, hey, th there really is a, uh, um, a reasoning why people see things the way they see things. And, and if, we, if we understand that, 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 that's fantastic. Now, there's one other view before we go into these things more in, in depth. And this is, this is a view that, um, once again, is, is more marginal. Arminianism and Calvinism are the two greatest forms of, of the atonement. And, and like I said, I think Arminianism probably has more weight in the United States than Calvinism. Um, but but, that's, but even, even in the um, Southern Baptist um, denomination, um, there is a massive resurgence of Reformed theology. Um, some people are really anti that. Um, some people are cheering it. But, but, but the point is, is that these are issues that if you do theology if you try to understand who God is, if you try to spend time in the Bible, if you try to spend time understanding the things of God, these are issues that you're going to come up with. And I just want you to be familiar with these concepts. So um, the, the, the last one I want to talk about is what I would call hypothetical. This one's called hypothetical universalism, and the reason we say hypothetical is because it's not universalism that Jesus died for everyone, and because he died for everyone, everybody's sin is forgiven, and that's the way it is. Hypothetical universalism says that Christ died for all without exception. So in that sense, it is like universalism, and it is like Arminianism that God in his foreknowledge knew that not all would accept or trust him. So, so now we've entered into um, something here, this, this idea of foreknowledge. But God in his foreknowledge, because he knows all things, he knew that there would be some that would accept and some that would reject. So, knowing that, he decreed that he would save the ones who believe. This is important here to fo follow what's going on here. So, Christ died for all, but the Spirit only applies salvation to the ones 
that accept. And so what this idea does is it separates the intent of the atonement and the application, which which is super, super, super important. That, and when we say hypothetical universalism, we don't mean hypothetical universalism in the sense of universalism that everybody is saved, but that there is a real opportunity for everyone to be saved. That that, that everybody has the the but but it's the difference here is the intent and the application. Re- remember before it was intent and result. Now it's intent and application. That that, that hypothetical and in this word here hypothetical means it doesn't exist, but it's 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 put out that that Jesus we can say he did die for all without exception like he he did he he died for everybody but god knew that there would only be certain people that accepted what he did and because of that god has made a difference here between the intent and the application so the people who end up being saved are the elect, but they're not elect because the atonement was limited. They're elect because God decreed the only way to get the all is through acceptance. And so his intent was hypothetical universalism. So he didn't die for something that he didn't accomplish. He, he really died for all. But... He only applied the all, because he has the the choice to do it, to those who would accept him, which means the elect are not people that were chosen by God before the foundation of the world as in Reformed or Calvinistic thought, but the elect are the people that God foreknew that would accept the all. And even though he died for all, he decreed that the only ones that could be saved were the ones that believe. And you see stuff like that in Romans 9, where it says that God can choose before you were ever born how you should come to faith. And, and there's many that would argue that in Romans 9 and Romans 10, especially as getting get Romans 10, that belief is what God decreed. He decreed that the only way you get in is not whether you were born in the womb or whatever, that God chose before the foundation of the world that these people would come to faith because they were the ones who believed. So what you have here is sort of it's a it's a it's sort of a understands that in reformed theology um, intent and result really matter like like if he intended to do something but he didn't accomplish it then that means God didn't accomplish what God wanted to accomplish hypothetical universalism says that universalism is held out to everyone to all that he really legitimately did die for all but God decreed because of his foreknowledge. He decreed that the only way to truly ever understand who he is is to accept him. And so the intent was for all, but the application was only for those who accept him. And then those people become the elect that we read out in scripture. And this is a way to um, hold that you can read the text that Jesus died for all, but to also hold the fact that not everybody ends up being a Christian. And so what God did is he divided intent and application. His intent was for all. He genuinely does want all to be saved, but he only applies the all to those who accept and therefore are the elect. Obviously, this is really tough to to follow, and I get that, but a lot of people are not happy with Calvinism or Arminianism or Universalism, and, and there's always somebody trying to figure out a way to make this thing to make this thing work. Um, and then, of course, you go back to some of the things that we've talked about earlier when we talk about Calvinism, open theism, Molinism, Arminianism. How does God know? What does he know? Um, these all become big, complicated messes when we talk about um, theology. I, I guess what I really want us to understand is that you know there are people that do see things differently, and, and they're not necessarily trying to pervert Scripture or distort Scripture they're really trying to understand something that really is a difficult subject, and this is a difficult subject. So we'll have to um, look at these a little bit more in depth, which we will continue to do, but but I do hope that what you're seeing here is, is starting to get some frameworks and some systems where you can start to hang things on so at least you can understand how people look at certain scriptures and understand where that, because as you know, depending upon where you you fall, and most of us do, 
usually have some sort of system that we're working with, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, and that system then becomes the lens through which we interpret. And so if you're an Arminian or if you're a Calvinist or if you're whatever you are, your system is probably going to prioritize certain passages above other ones, which then leads us to our interpretation. And, and that's where we're going to have to look is because what we want to try to do is be as biblical as we can be. We want to try to get rid of systems. We want to try to let the Bible speak for itself. But it's a very difficult thing to do because most of us do bring to the text some sort of presupposition on this particular issue. But I hope that at least what we've got here out of this conversation is starting to get some frameworks of why these things are the way they are and why people see things the way they see them and, and, and why there's this constant sort of... Um, uh, I, I would call it longing within theology to try to make these very difficult things easy to, to try to go, no, this is this, this is the solution. Here it is. Um, and my system's better than yours. Um, but I think if we're honest, we, we have to admit that th this is a really a complex subject and, and we're going to have to really pay attention um, biblically to some things. And, and, I, and I think we're going to come away with the fact of understanding that people are going to see this thing a little bit differently. There might be you know, universalism and hypothetical universalism, we might say, hey, those are maybe moving towards something that isn't really as biblical as we would like to see it. Um, but I do think that we're going to have to entertain the fact that people who are Arminian or Calvinistic, um, they're going to, they have a lot of reasons for why they hold to what they hold, and we're going to have to have some charity. So um, we will continue to discuss this stuff. Hope this is at least giving you some categories to think about. We'd love to hear your comments. Um, we'd love for y'all to talk about it in the in the um, comment section. Um, I think there's a lot of robust discussion that can go on. Um, we can all learn from each other, but I do hope that uh, you're seeing some things that, that help you think through this idea of what did Jesus do on the cross.